Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, what is the difference between psychopathy and antisocial personality disorder? Now to help answer this question about psychopathy and antisocial personality disorder, I'll be using an article that was published in 2016 by Ogloff and colleagues. And I'll put the reference to this article in the description for this video. Now in prior videos I've discussed psychopathy in some detail and of course antisocial personality disorder in some detail and I have explored the differences between them but this is really a more comprehensive description of the areas of overlap and the areas that differentiate these two constructs. I'll also be looking at psychopathy and how some of the factors related to it can relate to other personality disorders and other constructs. So first let's take a look at antisocial personality disorder, then we'll take a look at psychopathy, and then explore the similarities and differences between these two constructs. So with antisocial personality disorder, we see that this is a disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's a cluster B personality disorder. So it's in the same cluster as narcissistic, borderline, and histrionic personality disorders. We see that antisocial personality disorder affects about 3% of the population, but depending on what literature you look at, up to 80% of the population in correctional settings. We see the definition of antisocial personality disorder is broken into a few different criteria, and criterion A has the symptom criteria. Three of the seven symptom criteria must be met to satisfy criterion A. So with the symptom criteria, we see a tendency to violate social norms, and usually we look at this as committing actions that could be grounds for arrest. We see deceitfulness, impulsivity, irritability or aggression, a disregard for the safety of others, irresponsibility, and a lack of remorse. Criterion B indicates that in order for somebody to be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, they must be at least 18 years of age. With criterion C, we see that conduct disorder symptoms must have been present before the age of 15. So just as is the case with all personality disorders, there's no such thing as late onset antisocial personality disorder. We see with criterion D that the antisocial behavior cannot occur exclusively during the course of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Now moving on to the construct of psychopathy, we see here that psychopathy is an area that's studied. It's not a mental disorder someone can't really be diagnosed as having psychopathy or not in a technical sense. Of course, antisocial personality disorder, as I mentioned, is a disorder. We see that with psychopathy, it's often used in forensic settings, and there are a few instruments that are fairly popular to measure psychopathy. One of those is the psychopathy checklist revised. And there are a few different cutoff scores with this instrument. The prototypical psychopath that's referred to with this instrument the cutoff score here is 30, and high psychopathy, the cutoff score is 22. So again, even though somebody can't be diagnosed with psychopathy, someone could be considered to have this construct or not. This can still be made dichotomous, although usually we do think of it more as on a continuum as opposed to antisocial personality disorder, which of course is usually conceptualized as dichotomous. Either somebody meets the criteria or they don't. Psychopathy affects about 1% of the population, and in forensic settings, about 16% of males are affected, and about 7% of females are affected. So I'm going to conceptualize psychopathy using the psychopathy checklist revised, again, because that's a very popular instrument that has high reliability and high validity. So here with this instrument, we see that psychopathy can be divided into two factors, and each of those factors can be divided into two facets. So with psychopathy, we have two factors and a total of four facets. Factor one is interpersonal and affective, and factor two is referred to as social deviance. With factor one, we have two facets. One of them is interpersonal, and the other is affective. So with the interpersonal facet, we see certain characteristics. We see superficial charm. We see grandiosity, like we might see with narcissistic personality disorder. We see pathological lying, also considered to be associated with narcissistic personality disorder, and a tendency to be manipulative. With facet 
two, this is the affective facet, we see a lack of remorse, like we would see with antisocial personality disorder. We see shallow affect, and usually when we think of shallow affect in personality disorders, we think of histrionic personality disorder. We see being callous and having a lack of empathy, and again, this would have a fairly close relationship, we would think, with narcissistic personality disorder. And we see a failure to accept responsibility. Moving to factor two, again, this is social deviance, facet three, which would be the first facet of social deviance. This is referred to as lifestyle. So here we see a need for stimulation, like we might see with high extroversion. We see a parasitic lifestyle, a lack of realistic long-term goals, impulsivity, like we would see with antisocial personality disorder and borderline personality disorder, and irresponsibility, like we would see with antisocial personality disorder. Now facet four, which is the second facet for social deviance, is the antisocial facet. Here we see poor behavioral controls, early behavioral problems, juvenile delinquency, a revocation of conditional release, and criminal versatility. Of course, all these could be related to antisocial personality disorder. So now with this overview of antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy in mind, what are the theories about the relationships between these two constructs? Well, actually, there are quite a few theories, and I'm going to break them into really just two categories. One category is that essentially these two constructs are the same thing. Perhaps psychopathy is an extreme version of antisocial personality disorder, but generally these represent the same set of symptoms. The second theory is that there is a similarity between these two constructs, but technically they are different, and this technical difference is important. Antisocial personality disorder relates strongly to factor two, that would be the social deviance factor, and it relates weakly to factor one, that's the interpersonal and affective characteristics. So again, we're looking at a lot of research here on these constructs, and I'm just breaking this down in a fairly simple way into two basic groups. So with this particular study, we see that they used 136 participants who were in a secure forensic mental health facility. This was in Australia. And we see some interesting results here as they compared psychopathy to antisocial personality disorder. They used the psychopathy checklist revised and a screening version of that same instrument, and of course, the diagnostic and statistical manual for antisocial personality disorder. What we saw here is that individuals with a score on the PCLR of greater than or equal to 22, so that's high psychopathy, were 12 times more likely to have antisocial personality disorder than those scoring less than 22. Now this trend didn't continue as they moved the cutoff score higher, and the theory here is the sample size was simply too small. There was a prior study that showed that even with a cutoff score of 30, greater than or equal to 30, so that would be the prototypical psychopath cutoff score, that individuals with that score were 11 times more likely to have antisocial personality disorder. So we didn't really see that again in this study, but other studies have shown that. Now, when using a cutoff score greater than or equal to 30, so that prototypical psychopath cutoff score, 67% of individuals with that score were diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, but only 6% of individuals with antisocial personality disorder had a score of greater than or equal to 30. So we can see a real difference here in terms of how these two constructs relate. If someone has psychopathy, they're likely to have antisocial personality disorder, but if somebody has antisocial personality disorder, they're not necessarily likely to have psychopathy. Another finding from this study, and this is really not surprising, is that antisocial personality disorder had a strong positive correlation with factor two, the social deviance factor of psychopathy, and a fairly weak relationship with factor one. And the strongest relationship with antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy really was on that facet four of social deviance, so facet four of factor two. This is the antisocial facet, and it really shouldn't be surprising that the antisocial facet of psychopathy has a strong relationship with antisocial personality disorder. That kind of makes sense. So we saw some interesting results with this study. There was a small sample size, and of course the sample was taken in Australia, so it can't necessarily be generalized 
to the entire world. But still, interesting results, and it really shows us results that are fairly consistent with the results from prior research about this relationship between these two constructs. I hope you found this description of the differences between psychopathy and antisocial personality disorder to be interesting. Thanks for watching.